can wait for uh, yes. maybe i don't know yeah but i think it's okay because anyway go for live we go on live so i think we can start pehle sir are you there hey, yes i am okay so uh, good morning everybody today we are having the 10th lecture of our uh, international uh, silver jubilee women at series and it is my pleasure to invite uh, professor kailas nad uh, professor in our department to introduce the speaker of today and who will be dr yogeshwar nad mishra from nasa so welcome kailas nasa to introduce the speaker thank you thank you very good morning to all of you today i am privileged uh, to introduce uh, one of our distinguished alumni dr yogeshwar nath mishra uh, uh, for the 10th uh, lecture in the silver jubilee webinar series organized by international school of photonics about the speaker dr yogeshwar nath mishra is currently working as a researcher at nasa jet propulsion laboratory caltech usa he is an experimental physicist working on optical imaging and laser diagnostics of flow and combustion he likes to talk and collaborate on developing optical methods for flow and combustion characterization before joining jpl yogeshwar worked as a visiting faculty at the mechanical engineering departments of iit indore and iic bangalore through the scheme for promotion of academic and research collaboration that is spark program funded by the mhrd government of india he worked as a research scientist at the institute of engineering thermodynamics erlangen in germany and served as the main international pa of the spark project he obtained his phd in engineering degree from lund university sweden in early 2018 he has earned his integrated masters degree in photonics from center of excellence in lasers and optoelectronic science kusat uh, in kerala that is uh, our isp right now it was uh, for the new students uh, the msc was conducted by selos earlier now it is merged with international of photonics so it is the very same five year integrated program which uh, dr yogeshwar completed Dr. Yogeshwar has received a summer research fellowship from Indian Academy of Sciences in 2011, a SPAE Author Travel and Gra uh, Traveler Grant in 2011, a Petra Awards for Young Researchers from ILASS Europe in 2013, and AFORSK Foundation Sweden Research Grant Award in 2015. He was an invited speaker at the Gordon Research Conference on Laser Diagnostics in Combustion in 2017. currently uh, sorry he was awarded the the swedish research council international postdoc grant in 2018 he is currently associated with uh, iit indore as an adjunct professor and remotely supervising two phd students on laser diagnostics techniques development he is also associated with the university of gothenburg as a visiting researcher and uh, supervising yeah, some okay. postdocs and master thesis students He is a regular reviewer of journals such as Optics Express, Optics Letters, Applied Optics, etc. So this is a brief introduction about Yogeshwar uh, Nath Mishra, and uh, we are eager to hear from you your uh, uh, collaboration and new area of research at uh, NASA uh, uh, in USA. Over thank to Dr. Yogesh, uh, Yogeshwar Nath. yeah thank you very much for uh, such a nice introduction and also for inviting me for this uh, webinar i'm really happy to see you all once again after a long long time i met uh, class nasser recently in gothenburg it was really nice and uh, it's really a great pleasure for me to uh, actually talk about research in optics and photonics which is one of the area like which i was really excited about when i pursue started pursuing the course and uh, after uh, passing out and then doing my phd and all i see photonics still growing as a field and it has immense uh, future so with that i would like to start my presentation which is about advanced laser diagnostics for engine research so 
when i'm talking about engine research i will mostly talk about combustion and like flames and sprays which are used in engine research and i would like to just put a disclaimer that whatever uh, things i'm presenting here is is on my personal capacity and and nasa or jet propulsion lab or caltech uh, uh, doesn't i mean i do not represent their view so these are my personal views that's just i want to put a disclaimer so with that i would like to just start so i i wanted to make this pre presentation very pedagogic so i i just try to simplify it so the contents of my talk is like first i will talk about the background of engine or combustion research second i will talk about light droplet interaction in sprays because i have been working with the sprays uh then i will talk about the new technique which was uh, developed by my group uh, in lund when i was doing my phd that's called structured laser illumination planar imaging and i'm still uh, working in this particular uh, on this particular technique and then i will talk how we can use a uh, sleepy technique for droplet sizing in spray why droplet sizing is important then i will talk about everest thermometry in sprays and then i will also talk that how we can apply structural illumination in flames so what is the motivation for engine or combustion research why it is important i just want to highlight this part first so when you see every time when you see a rocket being launched you see uh, the combustion happening when i'm saying combustion you can see this fire here which is coming out of the rocket and it goes up so so what we are seeing here is 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 a lot of light and combustion happening the same thing is happening when we are driving our car so either if we have a diesel engine or gasoline this is a four stroke engine so at one particular stroke there is some combustion happening you can see the flame coming out and how do we achieve this combustion is using sprays and we also see combustion happening when we have candles burning so so what we observe from these three images is that there is combustion happening so i'll come to that why combustion is important how it is happening and with the combustion we have lot of light and when why i put this light uh, wide because it is a broadband continuum so that's why i wanted to put it wide so combustion is ubiquitous in our society as i said we, we use it for a specific task for example candle light welding flame or bunsen burner is one of the flame which is used in chemical lab uh, most often then for efficiency and low emissions when i say, say efficiency means energy conversion so we have uh, furnaces fluidized bed diesel engine gasoline rocket engine jet engine gas turbine for power generation and we also uh, uh, face these unwanted events for example like a fire explosion or detonation so we broadly uh, characterize this combustion process in two parts so we call it like a flame so basically this combustion is happening because of this flame so this is a bunsen burner and it's a it's a lab burner which is used for study purpose so there are like combustion can be divided in two types of flame one is diffusion flame one is premixed flame when we say diffusion flame means that there is a tube here coming out so we are actually this is the inlet for the fuel which we want to burn so i want to say that in combustion people use solid fuels liquid fuel fuels or gases also so all these three are three are are burned to to do combustion and this is a premixed flame where this tube has a opening so now i would like to show a video what is going to happen if if i let me stop this one so if the this hole is closed here which you saw here and only the fuel is coming so in this case this is a methane ch4 and then what is happening it is mixing with oxygen in the surrounding air and when it is when it is mixing it is doing lot of chemical reactions within the flame when it is burning and that's because of those uh, those uh, burning of a uh, flame or fuels this this light is coming out the same thing is happening if we close the if you open this uh, hole here so what is happening now oxygen and fuel are mixing before burning so this is called premix because both are burning uh, the fuel is burning or fuel is mixed before burning so this is called premix flame and when you would like to see how the temperature distribution look like i mean the flame really becomes very hot so 
due to this combustion process. So what we observe from uh, the video is that the combustion is a very complex process. And there's a lot of chemical kinetics which is involved. There are flow processes, physical processes, for example, diffusion, heat combustion, radiation, and also thermodynamics is involved. Then there are different phases. For example, when we use a liquid uh, a fuel combustion, I'll come to that later. Then we have droplets, we have vapor formation, we have particles. And how do we understand combustion? Mostly either we can use experimental techniques or we can use theory and modeling. So what is the uh, motivation for combustion research? Mostly in engines. So what we would like to achieve is, first thing we'd like to understand the basics or so the fundamental of combustion processes, how it is happening. And those understandings will help us to improve the efficiency of our engine. Because we would like to burn a fuel, but we, at the same time, we want to make sure that we uh, utilize the maximum output. We get the maximum efficiency out of burning that fuel. At the same time, we would like to redu reduce the emissions. And along with that, we would like to develop combustion on alternative fuels and new technologies. Because now, as soon uh, as soon the technology is progressing uh, due to the climate change, a lot of uh, emission norms are coming and then we need to adopt to different fuels when we can generate less emissions. And at the same time, as I said, we would like to improve safety. So we'd like to understand how we can suppress fire, in, uh, fire initiation and its spread. So how do we uh, study combustion using lasers and optics? This is a butan flame. So this is a very normal torch. People use, uh, you, you use it for, for lighting purpose and also for heating something. And when we use a spectrometer in front of this, we can see the, this is the emission footprints of chemical species which are generated during combustion. So what we see here, uh, the wavelength on the X axis and the intensity of light on the Y axis. And what we see is different chemical species are generated due to the burning of butan. Uh, in this flame. So what is happening here, the butane and oxygen are mixing and then combustion is happening. And depending on the wavelength, we can uh, select or we can detect different uh, chemical species. For example, we have OH radical, which is around 310 nanometer. Then we have CN, we have CH. We also have CH radicals, and then we have C2 swan bands. So, and then if if this flame is, is yellowish, then we produce a lot of, lot of soot and also pH particles. So, so now you got the, like, now we got a kind of flavor that, okay, this, uh, when the light is generated, we can actually uh, image it, or we can take a spectra on a spectrometer, and we can figure out which kind of chemical species are generated during combustion. So we can use lasers also to excite a different species in the flame, because as I said, there are different species in the flame and each species has a, a different spectra. And so we can excite the particular species. For example, here in a burner, we are using a laser sheet. I'll come to that, how do we form the laser sheet? And we can excite OH radicals using 283 nanometer. When I'm saying excite, we can do, uh, we can induce fluorescence. And I'm not going to talk about basics of fluorescence. I think everybody is aware about it. So uh, this is laser induced fluorescence, which we can generate. Uh, using 283 nanometer. At the same time, we can also excite CH2 radicals uh, by using different wavelength, 355 nanometer. And using optical filters, we can actually uh, detect the, the fluorescence of these uh, species, chemical species. So why uh, using a laser diagnostic is really helpful for combustion because it's a non-intrusive technique. We can do, uh, we can measure without disturbing the flow. And we can measure the species uh, in 2D, in 3D, and in 4D also. And I will uh, present 2D, mostly 2D measurement, and also 3D measurement. We can actually probe species of lowest yeah. concentration. We can go to parts per million sensitivity. We can measure temperature. As we said, that temperature goes really from 0 to uh, 2,000 Kelvin, and even higher than that in, in some engines, for example, in a diesel engine. Temperature is really high, and because of that, we also produce a lot of lot of soot and NOx. Then velocity, particle size, these are very important. 
and we can do high spatial and temporal resolution. So we can use laser sheet to look uh, in two dimensions. So this is the two dimensional image. Uh, let me just. This is the two dimensional image of OH radical. This is the formaldehyde radical. So we can see uh, at the same location in the same flame, this formaldehyde are formed here while the OH radicals are, are on the outer regions of the flame. So we can do two dimensional, three dimensional high spatial and temporal resolution. And one of the important uh, thing I would like to highlight is that uh, flame doesn't require a tracer or dye particle. I'm talking about the flame, not talk, I'm not talking about the spray. About that, I'll talk uh, just after a few slides. So flame doesn't require actually any tracer or dye particle because chemical species act as a reaction or heat release marker. As I said, we can probe the species inside the flame itself. So now I'm going to talk about uh, why do we like to uh, how do we burn liquid fuels mostly in combustion uh, when we are doing? So this is how do we achieve efficient combustion of fuels? So uh, let me escape and just, so this is the video here. What is happening? Uh, we are burning some wood and, and this, this, there is kind of fire formed, but we would like to achieve uh, like, we would like to quickly burn it. So what we, what we are doing here now, we are just uh, using a spray and we are spraying some diesel on top of it. And now you see how, how fast we can burn uh, or how, how fast we can form the, the flame. And this is one of the techniques uh, like we are using a spray to form uh, or to burn the fuel in an engine. So this is how uh, the engine look like. So in engine, you have cylinder. So we have this uh, nozzles and from these nozzles, the fuel is getting atomized. And, and when it is atomized, we are actually using a spark in this case to burn the fuel. And now you can see how these flames are formed out of this spray. So what is spray is doing actually, it is breaking the, the liquid, which is heavy, uh, or viscous uh, liquid in, in uh, tiny droplets, which droplets are evaporating. And when they are evaporating, they are formed in the gas phase and then we are burning the fuel. So that's how we achieve very faster combustion. If we don't evaporate it fast, we can't burn it very fast. So in this case, what is happening, we are, we are providing heat and then heat is expanding and then it is generating power, which is transferred, heat is transferred in mechanical energy. So I hope this is uh, clear now. So now I'll talk about atomizing spray. Why I'm talking about atomizing spray because atomizing sprays are the one which are converting the liquid in, in, uh, from liquid uh, to gas phase. And then, then after that we are burning it and then combustion is happening. So if we are able to actually study uh, atomizing spray properly, we can actually uh, improve the combustion process. So, my area of expertise or what I can say, I've been working mostly with the sprays and I will talk about spray diagnostics and how spray diagnostic is going to help us uh, in order to achieve efficient combustion. And what are the challenges when we are studying atomizing spray? So, so spray has a lot of application. Uh, sprays have a lot of application, for example, in spray painting and also for cutting the metal and also uh, when we uh, inhale uh, some some medicine we use them. So there are several applications for creating powders. Uh, and one of the major application of spray is combustion, as I said. So I'll come to that. So now I'll talk about how we can visualize sprays. So this is, uh, if you see this image here, uh, so, so what we are seeing here is this is an ethanol spray. So this kind of spray are used in a gasoline engine or let's say petrol engine car. And what you are seeing here is the formation of a cloud of droplets. So this is a cloud basically. And, and when you see this scale here, this is nine centimeter by five centimeter. I mean, this, this is formed in a large volume. And what we observe here also is, is that from one injection to another, uh, the shape of this this is spray changing. And not only that, actually uh, the size at some places we have very small droplet, at some places we have very large droplet. 
and also the number density of these oplets are varying depending on the position where we are looking at. So how this uh, cloud of droplets is formed? Actually, when we press the liquid, uh, you know, out of this nozzle, the the liquid is coming out and it is breaking up due to the aer aerodynamics uh, forces acting on this, and and this is forming a ligament and all. So this is on a, on a millimeter scale. And so from these two observations, what we found out that we we require a kind of technique which which can image these spray very fast. So we need high speed imaging. At the same time, we would like to visualize what's going on inside the spray because it will tell us, it will give us information about the size distribution, about the number density, and also about the evaporation, if we can measure the temperature. So depending on the observation that we have, actually in this region, we call it a spray formation region. And in, in, in this region where most of the droplets are spherical now, uh, that's called a spray region. There we would like to study droplet size, droplet concentration, droplet temperature, droplet velocity. So how do we uh, use laser diagnostic to characterize spray region? So I'll mostly uh, focus in spray region. So there are techniques which are very reliable ones. So if we use a laser beam and, and split the laser beam in two probes, and then we can form an interference pattern. And when the droplet crosses this interference pattern, it, it generates a Doppler signal. And by analyzing the droplet, uh, Doppler shift, actually, we can measure the velocity, we can measure the size, we can measure the concentration. However, what happens is, as I talked about that, uh, sprays are volumetric. Uh, so this is a point measurement technique. So you can just measure at a point. But since the spray is very dynamic in nature and it is, it is distributed in 3D, we require something which can uh, give us information on a centimeter uh, scale, basically. So that's why we are using a laser sheet. When I'm talking about laser sheet, laser sheet is kind of a, a paper sheet, like a paper sheet. You can form the laser sheet. Uh, in two dimension. I'll come to that, how do we form it? So what we can do now is actually we can image these uh, uh, droplets or we can image the spray on a longer, uh, on a centimeter scale, I would say. So we can get a large view of droplet field. Droplets, in this case, droplets are smaller than the pixel size and we can't, we can't resolve the droplet because now whatever information we are getting from the laser is scattering that is only imaged here. They, the possibility is that we can quickly uh, do 2D mapping. There's a possibility for 3D mapping. We can especially resolve it. And also we can make it temporarily resolved. So how do we form a laser sheet? That's what I want to talk about now. So here we have a laser beam coming out and then we have a cylindrical lens, which is negative cylindrical lens. So what negative cylindrical lens is doing actually it is, uh, basically expanding the beam in one direction. So the beam is going like this. And then we are using a positive spherical lens. So this positive spherical lens is trying to ensure that this light is focused in this direction. So then we are getting a thin slice of laser sheet. It has, so this is the, the height of the laser sheet and the, the thickness of laser sheet is around 500 microns. So it's a very thin laser sheet. And what these two lenses are also doing is kind of collimating the beam. At the same time, we are, uh, we are selecting the wavelength of these two lenses in order to get the magnification because we would like to magnify the beam. Sometimes we have a beam of one centimeter, uh, you know, uh, maybe five mm diameter or something like that, but we would like to magnify. Maybe we would like to form a sheet which is 10 uh, centimeter. And then we need to select uh, these two lenses in a way that we can magnify this, this incoming laser beam, uh, maybe more than 100 times or 10 times. That depends on the focal length. I'll not uh, go to uh, go in, the, in that detail. So, so then here we are forming a laser sheet, which is incident on the spray. And we can actually characterize the spray uh, using the fluorescence, as I talked about laser in this fluorescence, and also using the me scattering, because uh, the size of these droplets are in microns. 
while the wavelength of light which we are using is is in nanometer for example i'm using 532 nanometer and the size of droplets is 10 microns uh, to 50 microns so the droplet size is much much larger than the wavelength of light so mostly we have a me scattering now just one thing i want to rem uh, remind you that whatever uh, images now i'm uh, showing you regarding the spray that is not burning there is no combustion happening i just want to study how the evaporation of the droplet is happening how the spray is formed so i'm just talking about uh, a liquid for example a water spray or ethanol or gasoline or diesel so there is no combustion happening so in this case what is happening we are seeing the scattering of light or the fluorescence of light i'll come to that so this is one of the image a laser sheet image of of a spray uh, which was taken in 1984 uh, by melton and verdick and what they found is lot of blur happening this is is called image blur or low visibility and and why this visible uh, low blur is happening when we are sending the laser sheet i'll come to that because when we have light particle interaction uh, the 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 way you create the image it is it is actually determined by the photons how the photon are interacting with the medium and also the number density of of the particle in the medium for example we have a cuvette a glass cuvette and we have put let's say water and then we are illuminating this seal so this seal is here which is which is printed on on a, a plastic paper or something and then we are sending the the lamp so lamp has you know the photons the light has photons here and here is our detector on this side so let me use the pointer here so we are sending the photons from here so we are eliminating this seal from here this has only water on the other side of the cuvette we have a camera or let's say we have a camera or uh, a imaging lens and now i will do one thing is i will add some milk so when i'm adding some milk what now you will uh, see on the right side what will happen to the seal so what we see here is is that this is the trajectory of the photon so the photon is is going here but when it is traveling when it is trying to cross this medium because there are so many particles that is that it is interacting with so this is called multiple scattering and due to the multiple scattering the, the photon only has the information of the last interaction that it had with the droplet or with the with the milk solution with the milk particles and this is the reason why we don't see the seal anymore and that is the problem that is happening in in a spray also because in a spray it has millions of droplets and all these droplets have different droplet diameter different size and all these things so so when the photon we are sending the photon what is happening is is a lot of multiple scattering is occurring and due to that uh, the image looks very blur that we saw just a while ago so i would like to just simplify what is happening here so this is the light source as i said so we can actually uh, define the photon trajectory in in a, in a way that okay if we have the photons which are which are directly going to this lens without any interaction this is called ballistic photons if the photons has only one interaction with the droplet we we call it single scattering if scattered photon now i'm talking in terms of scattering of course this could also happen in terms of fluorescence i'll come to that later then there is multiple scattering because the photon is interacting with several times with with many droplets and then it is reaching the sensor the same thing is now happening here in uh, image b what is happening if we are sending the photon here and it is illuminating different droplets depending on the trajectory which photon is taking our camera will detect the light so our camera will not be able to distinguish that whether the light is coming from a single scattered photon or whether the light is coming from the multiple scattered photon because the both single and multiple photon can come from the same angle and this is one of the problem in 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 uh, in imaging uh, spray and when i'm talking about imaging with them i'm then i'm talking that okay the 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 camera is at 90 degree to the laser sheet so see what is happening here i just like to give you this uh, just kind of overview 
So this is the light propagation in sprays. Uh, is my pace good? Just want to know. It is fine, uh, Rogesh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So just just interrupt me or, or or just let me know if I'm going very fast. Yeah. So so what is happening here is is let's say we have many droplets or cloud of droplets here. And we had the laser beam coming in from here and we have the transmitted light here. So when I'm saying transmitted, means that our detector is just on the other side of the, the illumination here. And, and we can estimate how much, uh, how many photons or what is the uh, number density of, of these droplets and all using beard Lambert law, which is actually saying that uh, the incident light is, is actually decaying exponentially and that is depending on the L, which is the, the total length of the sample. The light is crossing. L is the number density. So how many droplets are there in the medium? And mu is the extinction cross section, which is the loss of light. Uh, or actually, this is a cross section. So it's, it's, a, it's a, what you call loss of light due to the interaction of the photon uh, on a surface area, basically. This is extinction cross section. There is another term we call it ex extinction coefficient that is different. So I, I just would like to uh, say here that uh, if we know the two interactions uh, between uh, like if photon had uh, interaction between two uh, droplets, then uh, we can actually estimate the mean free path length, which is equal to one divided by the number density and the extinction cross section. So this will give us information about that what kind of interaction that is happening uh, in the spray. And, and this term is very important, which is called optical depth, which is actually giving us information is the average number of scattering or absorption that the photon will have when it will cross the spray. So this is called optical depth. So if optical depth is one of the photon and the droplet, when it is coming out of the medium, we, we will say that the, the spray is dilute or there is average number of interaction that photon will have within the medium is one time only. If we have optical depth five or 10 means that it will have five time average interactions. If it is 10, then it will, it will interact 10 times with the droplet and then it will come out. So this is how we can say that, okay, whether the medium is, is, is dilute or it is optically dense. So now, the problem in in uh, in uh, for the light propagation in the spray is is not only uh, uh, the the uh, what you call multiple scattering, but the the main problem is also the laser extinction. When we are sending the laser uh, from the left to side, the intensity of light will reduce because uh, it, the light energy will be absorbed by the uh, by the droplets or it will be scattered in different directions. But we can estimate it using the beard Lambert law. We will also have the signal attenuation. When I'm talking about signal attenuation, when the signal from, from this plane will uh, actually start from here and it will reach the camera, it will also interact with this droplet in the path. And that's why I'm calling it attenuation because the intensity of the signal is also reducing. But we can also calculate it based on the Beard Lambert law. And then on top of it, as I said, there will be multiple scattering, which is unknown, and we cannot actually reduce it. And in order to uh, you know, address this issue, uh, my group in Lund actually, they developed this technique, uh, which is called structured laser illumination planar imaging. So I'll just talk about this technique, uh, how it works. So I'll come to the, the laser sheet. Uh, how do we create the laser sheet? This slide, which I've already shown you before that we are sending the laser beam. We are using a, a cylindrical lens, a spherical lens, and then we are forming a laser sheet. Now, the image of the spray look like. So this is the me scattered light. So this is the intensity of the light, which is, uh, sorry, the, uh, the scattering of the light, which is actually uh, recorded on this camera. It looks like this. Now, instead of this, we are forming something like this. So what we are doing is, uh, instead of a homogeneous illumination, we are actually uh, using the, the patterns or it's called, it's called spatial modulation. We are modulating the intensity of the laser beam. And this is called a spatially modulated laser sheet. And if we actually applaud this, then it will look like a sine wave. So it will be a sinusoidal 
uh, pattern, we can call it. And now the image of the spray will look like this. So instead of this, it will look like this. And so now we, this is called conventional uh, planar imaging. So this is how people perform planar imaging, but we are actually modulating the beam. And what we see here, if we analyze these two images, what we see that we, we have some information here, we have some information here of, but our laser sheet was only starting from here and it is ending here, but due to the multiple scattering, which I talked about, we also get the signal from this region because the photons are, are changing their trajectory. So they are, the light is coming from this, uh, uh, from this location also. So how do we suppress it? Now, if you see this region, it also looks very, uh, like very homogeneous, but here we have the sinusoidal uh, pattern. What we do is we extract the amplitude of this modulation. And when we extract this, then the image look like this from this image. But if you see this, uh, all the light which was here before is gone. Because what this uh, uh, technique is doing Using this technique, we are tagging the photons, which are only singly scattered. So the photons, which only had one interaction when it came out of the, the medium, that is only preserved here because this modulation will, will de demodulate it when the photon will interact melt multiple times. Only if there is single scattered scattering, this modulation will be preserved. So when we are preserving this amplitude of modulation, we are preserving the singly scattered photons. And that's why we are able to remove this artifact, which is coming from the multiple scattering. And this is the actually uh, the technique, uh, which we call structure laser illumination planar imaging, or we call it sleepy, to remove the multiple scattering. So, so how do we do it? Actually, we, we need to uh, take three images. So we, we uh, move the grating and then we create three images and then we use some kind of equation. So this, this equation, what we are doing is we are just taking the average of these three images and we call it conventional planar imaging, which is just using a homogeneous illumination. While in this case, what we are doing is we are doing I1 minus I2. So this one is the matrix of, of this image. This one is I2 is the matrix of this image, which has been taken with a phase difference of 120 degree to the first image. Now the third image is with a phase difference of 240 to the first image. And then we are doing I1 minus I2, I1 minus I3. And using uh, doing this process, what we are doing is we are su suppressing anything or any background which is identical. So all this background light, which is coming from the multiple scattering will be suppressed. Only the information from the singly scattered light will be preserved. So how, how we are actually uh, inducing the phase actually is just by moving this grating. So we are putting this grating on a translational stage, which is actually inducing uh, this phase difference in the image. And, and of course, you can talk that, okay, why you are using three images, why not one or two? I mean, we have used one or two images also, but uh, I don't want to go in detail uh, because it will take a lot of time. So I'm just presenting the technique which was developed. Uh, and then I also use the technique for uh, characterization of a spray. So now uh, this is uh, how the technique work. And now I will show the application of this technique. So we can, uh, as I said, uh, in a spray, it is very important to measure the size of the droplets and also the concentration and temperature because we would like to study the evaporation, which is happening uh, before the combustion starts. So uh, we would like to measure the size of the uh, droplets in a spray. How do we do it? So, so what we do is, uh, let's say we are using uh, 447 nanometer excitation wavelength in order to study the spray. And we are sending a light. So what will happen, as I said, it will be me scattering because the, the size of the droplets is, is in microns, 10 to 20 microns or 30 microns, while 447 nanometer is much, much smaller. So there will be me scattering, not the Rayleigh scattering. If the size of the particle and also the wavelength of light is the same of, of the same uh, order, 
then it will be Rayleigh scattering. In this case, it's me scattering. And me scattering is proportional to the liquid surface. And if the droplets are spherical, uh, mostly, then it will be D square, diameter is square, which will be the scattering of the light. But let's say if you're using some dye, for example, a fluorescein dye or eosine dye, I mean, a lot of people are working on dyes at ISP. And in any dye which, which gives very good signal, in this case, what we are doing is we are using just water and we are exciting with 447 nanometer. So we can actually uh, get the scatter light from the droplet. At the same time, we can also get the fluorescence light. Now the fluorescence light is volumetric because the dye is mixed within the volume of the droplet. So it is, uh, when it is getting excited, the fluorescence is, is depending on the volume of the droplet. So, so what is happening is now we have two signals. One is the me scattering, one is the fluorescence of light, a laser induced fluorescence. One can be the surface dependent, one can uh, be uh, you know, proportional to liquid volume. So if we have many droplets, then actually the fluorescence signal will be the summation of di uh, cube because it's a volume dependent and the droplet is spherical. So the volume is D cube, while me scattered signal or me scattered light will be D square. And these are the experimental parameters, uh, which depends on the dye concentration, laser energy, and also on the camera and detector efficiency and all, et cetera. So now what we are doing is how do we calculate the size of the droplet? So if we divide these two intensities, or let's say leaf divided by me ratio. If you take the ratio of these two droplets, uh, sorry, of these two signals. So D cube divided by D square, and then we have this parameter. So let's say this is K. And this term is called SMD, which is Southern mean diameter, which actually gives us information about the active surface area that uh, a spray has, or when the spray is formed, which surface area is active. So it gives us information about the mean diameter. So now if you divide D cube by D square, then we have only SMD, which is uh, Southern mean diameter. But the, if we have many droplets, the problem what happens is the same I talked about. We have multiple scattering issue. So the image will look very blurry. And what is happening uh, that uh, here we have the, the multiple scattered fluorescence and also the, the multiple scattered, uh, scattered light. So we need to suppress this. If you would like to get a uh, leaf me ratio, which is equal to SMD, we'll have to suppress this. And that is where we are again using the structural illumination or sleepy technique in order to correct it. So as I said, we require three images. So we took three images of the fluorescence, three images of me. Now you will say, how, do, how are you taking two images? We are actually using two cameras. So two cameras are simultaneously taking images. So one camera has a fluorescence filter, one camera has a me filter, which is only collecting the me uh, light actually, and another one is collecting only the fluorescence light. Now, as I said, we can use the these three images to form a conventional and, and a slip image. So this is the fluorescence, this is me scatter light, and now we need to divide it to, to actually get the, uh, get the southern mean diameter or the mean diameter of the spray. So this is how it looks. I mean, this is the conventional image, and this is the slip image. And the difference you clearly see here is because of the multiple scattering, we have a lot of blurry effect, which is form, uh, which is actually happening for, for this spray. And also there is a signal from the non-illuminated region because my laser sheet is only starting from here and it is ending here. So the illumination plane is only this, but because of the multiple scattering, we have signal here and, and it gives us very wrong perception about the size. It, it says that actually here we have the, the droplet size, or this is the droplet size here. In this region, mostly we have non-spherical particles or ligaments or liquid structure, but mostly here we have spherical droplets. And also what we found is, is, is that the signal was, uh, it is saying that we have a more or less a large uh, droplet diameter in the center, while on the edges we have a small, but this is a holocone spray. In holocone spray, most of the biggest droplets are on the edges while it is hollow in the center. So using this technique, actually we got very reliable uh, information of the droplet SMD. 
So I would like to skip this one. So this is how we found uh, the droplet shorter mean diameter, which gives us information that in this uh, on the edges we have very large uh, droplet diameter, which is around 30 microns to 25 microns, while in the center we have droplets which are five microns. So now I have let's say yeah five more minutes, right? So now I'll I'll just talk about how we can do 3D mapping. So I I would just like to quickly go on. This one. So when we would like to do 3D mapping, what actually we did is we are sending the laser sheet. So this is the laser sheet. Now the camera is here, but now the the this is the this is the chamber. So this chamber is actually mimicking uh, engine, like uh, as I said, a GDI engine or gasoline engine. So we are forming this spray here, but now we are moving the spray while the laser sheet and the camera are on the fixed position. So we can actually uh, slice the spray in kind of a bread, like we slice the bread using a knife. The same way now the light is actually slicing the bread. So uh, slicing the spray, sorry. So now we have at different depths, we have the information how the size of the droplet is, is, is distributed, which is very important for us to understand. And this is the three dimensional. So now we what we are doing is we are stitching all the matrix from different layers, 2D layers, and then we are forming a three-dimensional map of the droplet size. Now to the, so this is how we, we see that, okay, uh, how different uh, sizes of the uh, droplet size is distributed in, in the spray. Now I will come to the thermometry. So it will just take five more minutes. So how do we do thermometry means that we would like to see, uh, we would like to measure the temperature and because we would like to understand the evaporation of the fuel. So again, we are using some dye and some dyes are, are actually temperature sensitive. So for example, in this case, I was using fluorescent dye in water. And when I'm exciting this dye with 447 nanometer. So if you see the spectra here, a spectral photometer what you photometer what you see is if i'm heating the the water then there's a shift in the spectrum and also uh, the intensity i mean this is the normalized intensity plot but if if you see the non normalized you will see the intensity is reducing either reducing or increasing with change in uh, the the liquid temperature and this increasing or de decreasing depend on, on the solvent. For example, if you're using different uh, uh, liquid, then it might go up or down. Or if you're using another dye, it can have a different behavior. But essentially what I want to show is that in, uh, in this curve, the, if you see the spectra here, the black one is 90 degree and it has shifted from here to here. In this case, so what we are doing is we are selecting two bands so these are the fluorescence bands. So when I'm saying bands means we can, we can buy the filters, which are starting from 500 to 520 nanometer range. We can put them here. We can buy a filter, another one from 570 to let's say 610. So we are selecting two bands. One is uh, temperature sensitive. Another one is temperature insensitive. So when we take the ratio of these two, we can actually, which this is proportional to the temperature. So the same thing we can do with the droplet, as I said. So we applied this, the, the sleepy technique uh, for thermometry, for measuring the temperature of the liquid. So this is the conventional approach. Conventional means people have been using, using the uh, homogeneous illumination. In this case, as I said, we are using our grating and then we are creating the modulation and then we are forming the seat. What we see here is there is no illumination which is cleaned up by the, uh, by the technique. And also because there is a thermal couple on the backside, which is, this, which is clearly visible in, in conventional and in, in sleepy technique, we can actually suppress it significantly. And also we see in terms of the dynamic range, if you see the temperature here, it starts from zero to 3.5. In this case, it goes to 0 0.9. So the sensitivity is much, much higher in this case. So this is the sensitivity curve. And this is the conventional image. This is the sleepy. So we can clearly see how it changes. And the sensitivity is much, much stronger in this case. 
so then we applied this uh, technique uh, on spray temperature so uh, and then spray temperature what you see is as i said we would like to see the evaporation so uh, the the spray temperature is 25 degrees c but if i if i just change the if i increase the liquid temperature now we can see the gradient happening so now the tem tem the liquid is at 55 degrees c and we can clearly see the temperature change in this case so now i i'm just taking two more minutes so this was the the application of the approach in sprays now i'll just talk about flames so this is how this is the, we actually applied this technique in flames where we would like to actually measure the the ph and soot Uh, particles so i just would like to say that this technique has also been used for uh, measuring two species at the same time and and this has been done using actually uh, taking advantage of the fourier transform so what we are doing is we are sending the so this is a setup actually we i actually i build up uh, during my visit there and now the setup is there at isc so what we are doing actually here is uh, we have the laser sheet which have two different wavelengths so this is 283 nanometer this is 532 nanometer and one is exciting the soot particles another one is exciting the oh radical or or the ph uh, molecules and 283 is exciting here so what is happening is we are recording this on a single camera because we can take advantage of a modulation in in a fourier space because we are sending the light from different direction in the fourier space these two the components of these two signals are uh, stored at different location for example the the li i light which is called laser induced incandescence which is here and the fluorescence is is stored here and later on we are actually doing some you know fourier filtering and also some uh, we are using some filter and then inverse fourier transform to separate these two signals so these are the flames which we used uh, and then we got very nice images and we also published it so with this i would like to acknowledge the funding uh, for all this work which i have been doing from cd research council in germany we had uh, you know from european research council and also as i mentioned the scheme uh, for promotion of academic and research collaboration and with that i would like to thank you for your kind attention and as a experimentalist i always believe in this that in theory there is no difference between theory and practice but in practice there is with this i would like to thank all of you for listening to my talk yeah thank you okay sir the 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 session is open for discussion uh, yeah. i have a question written here yeah uh will the velocity of the droplets can also be calculated say velocimetry if so how yeah 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 i mean people have been uh, using uh, piv you know particle image velocimetry to i mean particle image velocity metry is one of the uh, most famous technique in in flow and combustion and they actually use a uh, double pulse laser so they are actually sending uh, two laser pulses one after another and there is a delta t so they they know the delta t and when they are taking these two images on a camera we are actually we can see that what is d1 and d2 so we know the distance right so we know that okay how much particle that has moved from t1 to t2 and then we are doing co correlation from uh, one image to another one and then we can actually divide d uh, d2 minus d1 divided by t2 minus t1 and then we can get the velocity so that's how people have uh, calculated the velocity also and particle image velocity is very uh, famous technique in in combustion in flow to understand the velocity or to measure the velocity in 2d and 3d yeah okay i have another question can this technique be extended to laser produced plasma uh yes we can we can uh, we can use this technique to laser induced plasma if you want to prove the laser induced plasma because actually uh, one of i mean now my previous group in lund actually they they are uh, studying plasma using this technique one of the advantage of this is uh, why, I'm, why i'm talking about the plasma because in in combustion also people are moving to plasma for example people are now using uh, lasers to create 
the flame. So they would like to use the laser to ignite the flame. So they are actually focusing the laser and then they are forming a plasma, which plasma propagates and then it can actually burn the fuel in, in much better way than using the nozzle or using the conventional approach. So people are actually uh, investigating the plasma using this technique because this technique actually removes any background light which is coming from the reflections or, or surrounding. It will only give you the information of the plasma. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about uh, thrusters to be used in rockets? Uh, you mean thrusters uh, that people are using uh, I, in... in yeah, I, I think mean, I think so. That that is only information that is provided. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, people can. Uh, I mean, wherever, as I said, uh, wherever uh, this, uh, wherever we are doing, uh, you know, liquid combustion, or we would like to burn something, we are using a spray. Whether it's gas turbine or let's say it's a thruster, or let's say in rocket propulsion, wherever it is, where wherever we are using liquid we need to uh, evaporate the fuel and we need to do the combustion. So, I mean, then we need to use the droplet, right? I mean, we need to evaporate uh, the, the fuel. Yeah, but if it, uh, if it is a gas, then we don't need to evaporate it. It's already, uh, you know, ignited. So then people are just using laser diagnostic to understand the, you know, distribution of different species. Uh, I didn't, uh, uh, you know, brought that slide, but I mean, people are, just understanding, I mean, studying combustion, 2D, 3D, or, or 4, 4D measurements they are doing. Yeah. Uh, what about the, the resolution, the, the spatial resolution of the measurements that can be achieved using slippy technique? Uh, is there any limitation for that? I mean, spatial resolution, I would say it depends uh, like your, your sample, right? If, if the flame is really big, and, and then, then you would like to form a laser sheet, which is, let's say, 10 centimeter in, in height. So the height of the laser sheet is really high. Now the spatial resolution will be governed by the number of pixels that you have in your camera. How good, do you, good is your imaging system? So it, it is all, it, it's all like, uh, you know, related to which kind of flame you are probing or which kind of spray you are uh, probing. But what we found is that a spatial resolution uh, is, is better in comparison to conventional approach. Only not spatial resolution, but mostly we are improving the image contrast because that is very important because image contrast, uh, we are suppressing the background signal. And so the uh, image contrast is, is enhanced in compared to the conventional techniques. Yeah. I think uh, that is all about the questions. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I see the comment from uh, Radha Krishnan, sir. I would like to say hello to him and my pranam to him. And I hope he's fine and he's, he's healthy. Yeah, I can see it. Yes. Yogeshwar. Yes. Let me ask one more question. One more question is posted here. Yes. Yeah, yeah sure. Sure. Uh, uh, is it so, Pramod, sir? Nothing. I only see only one yes, question. Sir, there, there, there is one more question. There is one more question. Okay. Okay. I only see one. Could yeah, you now, please yeah. explain once again how you get rid of the multiple scattered signals in the imaging. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think that's uh, so. What I'm saying is, let me show another slide. So maybe that can be very helpful. For I will just. I, why I can't, okay, I can escape my, I have a backup slide. <laughs> so let me, this is, so, so how this technique is working, I just want to give some like uh, visualization. So this is, this is slide from, from my supervisor who most, most of time use this slide for people who would like to understand the technique? So, uh, so Yogesh, this is. Uh, Yogesh, are oh. you uh, showing some slide? You're not able to see that. Let me let me share that. Yeah, yeah, yeah let me yeah. share that. I, this. Now you see it. Yes. Yes. So, so what is happening? This let's say this is a cuvette. This is a this is a cuvette, and this in this cuvette, what we are we are mixing it some dye and some water. Okay, so the dye is mixed with water. 
now this is this is our modulation which is which i said as i said is is uh, modulated so it's a spatially modulated so it is representing a sine curve right now this is going and now if we see the modulation so this is the image taken so this is the laser sheet this is the camera here and then laser sheet is going like this now if we come to a and b if we plot these two uh, we can see the modulation on a on location a and this is the modulation location b right what we already see is because of the extinction of light this modulation is going down and also because of the multiple scattering this this modulation is getting destroyed when the photons are crossing the medium okay so so the amplitude of of single scattered photons will will start decreasing as the more photon will go within the medium and then uh, more multiple scattered photon will come out so now i'll go to the next image what i want to show is is that anything which is uh, which is modulated that is only coming from the single scattered photon because i have said when the photon will interact many times with a single droplet it will only remember the information of the last interaction right because if if i i have my droplet and what photon droplet is interacting with the photon then it has surface area info, uh, information let's say and now the light it is it is going on another path but then again it saw another droplet so it forgets the information what it had with with the you know initial interaction or the previous interaction so in this case the same thing is happening now most of most of the now we we send a pure sinusoidal but this sinusoidal is now changing because the the component of multiple scattering is now coming in display because if there was no multiple scattering we should get a pure sinusoidal wave here also but because of the multiple scattering but this multiple scattering is not modulated because as more scattering will come this amplitude of modulation will be disturbed as i said because it will not remember the inform photon will not remember the information which was uh, encoded on it uh, when it started like when it was it was just going to travel within the medium so what we are doing here is most mostly these components are actually multiple scattering so now if you if you look at this image here if there was if this is the laser sheet only so it's this is a homogeneous modulation so it will look very flat line you know like if we plot it along this line but now if we modulate this it will look like a sine wave right so what we are doing is we are using this equation and we are changing the uh, we are actually getting three images so we have something like this so what we are doing is we are only extracting this envelope which is modulated and because we know that this envelope is only consisting of single scattered photon and we are only uh, preserving the amplitude of this envelope only so whatever multiple scattering is there it is suppressed that's how it is working and in a simple sense the multiple scattering is non modulated so when we are subtracting here i1 minus i2 it is actually getting suppressed as a background it's like a background when you take two images from a camera if the background is 50 on one one uh, one image and uh, if background is 50 on another images if you subtract those two images it will be zero so background will be uh, you know suppressed the same thing is happening with the slippy technique so i hope it is clear <laughs> i don't know mm -hmm. so that's how it is yeah uh, so in this case only we are we are we are actually uh, what okay i should have used the pointer i'm sorry so this is the amplitude of modulation so we take three images now because this modulation is only coming from the single scattered photon we are only preserving this modulation while whatever background signal is coming which is non modulated or the multiple scattering is also non modulated when we are putting uh, the matrix or the intensity value in these three equations it is getting suppressed and then only the component which is modulated is is actually demodulated and it is appearing as an image so that's what i want to say and and if 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 there is some more question i mean of course there are publications and i can also send uh, you know my thesis or 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 more information and okay someone is interested i mean he can email me anytime I'll okay okay sure uh, 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 i think professor radhakrishnan is there in the meeting uh, uh, professor pramod uh, yes, professor actually is, uh, 
in the meeting i think uh, let me let me see whether i can because yogeshwar was asking uh, yeah about this uh, yeah i promoted uh, yes sir is there to, yeah. ah so he is there yes yes you can unmute him and yes he can unmute and speak now he's free to do so radesh sir, sir uh, you can unmute yes ah yes hi sir pranam can, how are you so you, you can also oh, sit on your video sir if you want hello <laughs> hi sir how are you fine can you hear me yes yes i can hear you can you hear me okay. so happy to see happy to see you people during our uh, <laughs> the silver jubilee celebrations yes yes i am also I very are, happy uh, talking to you after a long time doing wonderful yes. work thank you sir thank you so much thank and you for your please, blessings and also for your guidance yeah okay please do touch please do keep in touch with indian institutes yes yes yeah even definitely i am always in touch plan, even if you are planning to settle in america or say some other country please do con- yeah, keep in touch with our indian institutes Yes, yes. I'm always in touch with uh, people in IIT Indore, as I said, at ISC Bangalore. So due to pandemic, I couldn't visit. But as when uh, you know circumstances get better and you know situation gets better, okay. I, will, I will definitely go there. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Wish you all the best. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, we can wind it up. Thank you, Kailash sir. Thank you, Pramod sir. Uh, it's my great pleasure to thank uh, Dr. Yogeshwar for a beautiful talk, and of course for being a part of our Silver Jubilee celebrations. And a big thanks to the participants for joining us today, even though the weather is not pleasant. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, and we meet again with another lecture. Thank you. See you. Yeah, I, I just want to finish this uh, thanking all of you for organizing this, and once again. Uh, yeah i would like to say hello and regards to all my teachers and also my best wishes to everyone who is pursuing photonics and any time if you want any guidance just you know contact me and as i said we have uh, some collaboration at gothenburg at iit indore so we will have some positions coming up so any time you can contact me and i will try if i can do anything or you know anyone is you know interested in these kind of positions Uh, this just i would like to say that yeah thank you thank you yogesh thank, thank you, you thank you for nice to be here yeah yeah